briefly, but before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge once again the large number um, of volunteers, this team of very enthusiastic people, both UCLA staff as well as student volunteers as well, who have been essential in making this all happen tonight. And beyond UCLA campus, there are a number of different chefs uh, involved in this effort, as well as our generous sponsors as well. So welcome. We're very thrilled to, for you all to be here this evening at the first inaugural Science and Food event. As Victoria mentioned, I myself am a scientist coming from the other side, the science side. And so even though we realize that many of you may not be here tonight to hear us, or for, um, it's really for us, um, we're at any rate very excited that you're here and that we can share with you some of the fascinating things that we think and how we think about food from the perspective of science. So now that we've lured you in, you in and you're here, these are some of the questions that with our scientific perspective and passion for food, we think are particularly interesting. So many of these questions you'll learn more about throughout this series of the public lectures this spring. And they also provide the basis for the general education course that I'm instructing this quarter at UCLA, Science and Food, the Physical and Molecular Origins of What We Eat. So this is a busy slide just detailing um, some of the main topics and questions that provide the basis of the class. And each week, we highlight a different concept in the physical and physiological sciences, and then tie that into the perspective of food from both chefs and farmers that lecture in class. So we endeavor to make this a multimedia experience. And so to this end, we have both science lectures by yours truly, as well as the guest chef and farmer lectures. Pictured here is Jordan Kahn, who brought to class a bunch of herbs that he'd foraged the day before from Topanga Canyon. So food is such a delici delicious topic that we can't resist from keeping it out of the classroom in other ways as well. So at each class, we typically have at least one taste test for the students, such as chocolate chip cookies or marinated tofu. And in this case, we marinated the tofu for one hour and 20 hours, and if you let tofu sit in very salty soy sauce for 20 hours, it makes an unforgettable learning experience about diffusion. <laughs> so not only are the kids eating in class, they're also making food to eat as well. We have these DIY kitchen experiments that are part of the weekly homework assignments that they have to take home and um, do in their own kitchen or dorm room. One of the students does her homework at Starbucks, and so she's measuring diffusion coefficients in Starbucks. In this case, they made ice cream, which was one of those popular topics. And then last but not least, we equip the students with recipes so they can take the knowledge from the classroom and go back to their kitchens and make such beautiful creations, such as this dish by John Lynn, utilizing his knowledge of diffusion and spherification. They'll also be out doing final projects where they're learning to think and be like scientists. So in a pop quiz earlier this week, I quizzed the students to share some of the most interesting things they learned so far. And so here are some of the main topics that I thought I'd share with you tonight. One is that meat tenderizers such as enzymes that are found in fresh pineapple and papaya work by breaking down proteins, which we demonstrated by using this piece of pineapple on a cube of gelatin and measuring its mass over time. We also learned that cold temperatures and frost are extremely important for the sugar content of vegetables. This is thanks to the guest farmer lecturers who came to class. These sugars are extremely important for flavor and, of course, also for the resistance of these, these vegetables to cold as well. Lecithin, such as molecules naturally found in cell membranes, these are also widely used to improve food textures in the case of salad dressings and chocolate as well. And last but not least, it was also surprising for some of the students that they could learn how to think like a scientist and do experiments. So you may be saying, I want to take that class, which you can follow along through at our website, 
and more importantly, at the series of public lectures that we're bringing to you. So this evening, we have the pleasure of learning about the science of barbecue with Nathan Mirval. And to enhance your science experience and um, discussion and thought on science and food, we have also are going to have a surprise panel discussion at the end of this lecture with Evan Kleiman, Vinny Tolo, and John Shook. So Evan is the host of Good Food, KCRW's show, and also has interviewed over 6,000 people in the last 14 years, is the author of six cookbooks, and also chef and um, owner of Angeli Cafe, which is now in pop-up form. John Shook and Vinny Tolo are the chefs and co-owners of Animal and Son of a Gun, local restaurants here in LA. They're also the co-authors of Two Dudes, One Pan, and, um, and named by Food and Wine as some of the best young chefs in America. So we're very pleased and delighted to have them join us this evening to complement the discussion with Nathan Mirvold that will take place after the lecture. Now, all of you should have received question cards if you want to ask a question or feel that you might have the urge coming on to ask a question. Please write your questions on the question card. If you don't yet have a question card, please raise your hand and volunteers will come by and give you question cards. These will then be collected at the end of the lecture and distributed to um, Evan Kleiman, our gracious moderator. Can we dim the lights already? We have this worked out, don't you worry. <laughs> All right, so on to the topic of this evening, just to give a little teaser. This is a topic we're going to be covering in my class in a couple of weeks, and actually John and Vinny will be coming back as guest lecturers to highlight how they prepare different cuts of meat in different ways, and how you can optimize your cooking method for a particular cut of meat or muscle. Now, in the DIY kitchen experiments, the kids are going to be probing the texture of different cuts of meat. But in a simpler experiment, they're just going to be measuring the elasticity or squishiness of jello. And this is not too far from what we do in my own lab, uh, where we're probing the squishiness or texture of individual cells. This turns out to be important not only for the texture of foods that we eat, but also in the terms of physiology, because cells need to squeeze and deform through very narrow spaces. It also turns out that these, the squishiness or deformability of cells is altered in disease. And so to this end, we are inventing new technologies to be able to probe these properties. But you probably don't care so much about this as to how you could benefit from um, knowledge of deformability of cells in your own lives. And so without any fancy equipment, here's an experiment you can do yourselves. But without further ado, um, Nathan Mirvold will be shedding more light onto the issue of cooking meat and barbecue this evening. So I'd like to warmly welcome Nathan. We're very thrilled that he could join us this evening at, on UCLA campus. He is the principal author of this remarkable work of modernist cuisine, which is this multi-volume plus 45 or 40 pound book um, that is a remarkable encyclopedia on, on food and cooking. So just to um, recap some of the ways it's been described by luminaries such as Ferran Adria and Harold McGee, this is a masterwork, a landmark contribution to the craft of cooking, a breathtaking new benchmark to understanding cooking, and it's destined to be as an important work for the 21st century as Escoffier's Ma Cousine of the 20th century. So importantly, as Victoria mentioned, Nathan is also UCLA alum, um, has, holds two degrees, bachelor's and master's, as well as master's and PhD from Princeton. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of renowned physicist Stephen Hawking at Cambridge University and then went on to become chief technology officer of Microsoft before founding his own company, Intellectual Ventures, and 
did I forget to mention, he's also a paleontologist, professional photographer, um, member of the team that won the World Barbecue Championships in Memphis. And thus, it is therefore fitting um, that he is here with us this evening to tell us more about the science of barbecue. So without further ado, Nathan, thank you so much for coming. OK, if we can uh, bring the lights down. Because it's much better to look at the pictures than look at me. So we're going to talk a little bit about the science of barbecue. Uh, but before that, I wanted to say a little bit about my book, Modernist Cuisine. Because <laughs> you got to have some way to get to uh, make the gig make sense. Um, anyway, it's uh, five volumes plus a kitchen manual. Um, it tries to explain a couple of, uh, it's got lots of recipes, it has 1,800 recipes. But the recipes are actually the smallest part of the book in the sense that the, the point of the book is to explain how cooking works, uh, some of the history behind it, uh, and the techniques that one uses in cooking. Uh, recipes are great if you know already what the equipment is about, you already know what the technique is, and you're really interested in proportions and ingredients and flavors. Uh, but we wanted to go beyond that and explain things like how deep frying works or how a, uh, a grill works. Here's some fun facts about the book. Six volumes, 2,438 pages, 1.1 million words. If you put those into a single line of text in Microsoft Word, it would be seven and a half miles long. I'm not sure why you would do that, but we thought that was cool. Um, we took 150,000 pictures, and 3,200 of them were good enough to put in the book. Um, 1,522 recipes, plus a whole bunch of variations. Those came from 72 of the best chefs in the world. Six research cooks worked on the, the project. 44 editors, um, writers, art staff. 40 pounds, and here's my favorite statistic. Four pounds of ink in one copy. Unbelievable, but it turns out on a full page picture, there's about a thousandth of an inch of ink. And you add up 2,500 of those, and that's about a two and a half inch block of ink. <clears throat> it was quite a process creating it. Uh, it's quite a big thing. It's, uh, the kitchen manual is on waterproof paper. We put a lot of effort in to try to have step by step techniques to explain how to do different things in cooking. Um, <clears throat> We've got a bunch of what we call parametric recipes that um, give effectively formulas for cooking. In this case, this is for making meat jus. And you won't be able to see all of it here, but we've got about a dozen different types of meat jus and all of the different proportions uh, that you can use. So this is a little bit like a master recipe, but it, putting it in table form lets you put more variations in than if you did sort of master recipe variation approach. Uh, we have a lot of example recipes. This is from our gels section. So here we have uh, hot orange gel, quince gel, green apple, and banana. We also do have some, some more conventional looking recipes. This is one for a beef rib steak where we are trying to explain what in our view is the ultimate way to make steak. Now, of course, that's a very personal thing. Lots of people have their own idea of what ultimate is or should be. Um, but uh, we wanted to address that. So I'll, I'll just walk through a couple of the volumes, then we'll get to barbecue. Volume one is mostly things that don't exist in other cookbooks. It's about history and fundamentals. So in this uh, volume, we have the history of cooking, starting with fire, actually. We, um, we kind of got carried away in this project, if you hadn't <laughs> figured that out. And <laughs> uh, it's not clear that if you write a 2,400-page cookbook, you have a good way of saying no. <laughs> So we started on history and whoop, we were all the way back to fire. Uh, but we also described things like heat. What's the fundamental physics of heat? If you have a two inch thick steak and a uh, one inch thick steak, how much faster will the one inch thick steak cook than the two inch? And most people don't know, and, or they would guess twice. The man over here is guessing four times, or he knows it's four times, and he's right. It roughly goes as the square of the thickness. That's a simple rule, but it's a simple rule that I never saw in any cookbook. Um, and that comes because of diffusion, a, a scientific process that Amy was mentioning earlier. Diffusion roughly scales like the square root of length. Now I say roughly because if you have irregular shapes and things, then, then of course it's a little bit different. We also talk in uh, this volume about uh, chemistry, 
about heat. What does heat mean? You know, everyone knows that uh, your kitchen equipment has got, uh, at least if it's electrical, is denominated in watts. Well, we have a little mini biography of James Watt. Okay, and, and what, turns out Watt, Watt's original insight in the whole thing, he was a, a professor in Edinburgh, he was hired by a Scottish distillery who wanted to know why they were using so damn much peat to, to distill the, the, um, the scotch. And you could bring it up to temperature, and you didn't need much peat, but you seemed to need an awful lot to get it to boil. And so Watt did some of the first research in the latent heat of vaporization. Turns out it takes a lot of energy to boil a liquid, because a gas has a lot more degrees of freedom thermodynamically. And those insights he got from the distillery, and maybe other kinds of inspiration from the distillery, we're not sure, um, helped him improve steam engines and, and become, become very famous, but there was a food orientation. So anyway, that's what volume one is about. Volume two is techniques and equipment. Uh, and that's another area that typically isn't covered in cookbooks. Uh, so here we describe how traditional cooking works. And we'll be talking in more detail about barbecue, and that's one of the things we cover here, but deep frying, sauteing, um, uh, steaming, almost every classic technique of cooking, we describe how it works. We don't give lots of um, recipes because the whole the world has made lots of books that, that will give you that. But we explain the, what really happens, you know, what happens inside your oven. Um, to do that, you can see from the cover, we cut a lot of stuff in half so you could get the magic view of what happens inside. And when people see those photos, they say, oh, you must be really good at Photoshop. And I say, yes, I actually am pretty good at Photoshop, but, but we really cut a pan in half, OK? <laughs> um, in fact, recently, this isn't in the book, but um, uh, recently we cut a whole Viking oven in half. Um, it, was, it was really, it, it, it took a day. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you the real secret of photography with pans cut in half. You make a hell of a mess. Uh, but we had this great philosophy. It only had to look good for a thousandth of a second. You know, so once the shot was taken, it didn't matter if it all went to hell. So anyway, in here we describe also a lot about equipment, but not traditional equipment. That's relatively well explained. We explain every kind of scientific equipment or other new kinds of equipment that people have invented to try to push cuisine forward. A lot of chefs have started using equipment that was originally meant for science labs. Uh, so a centrifuge is a great example. And we have a lot of recipes and a whole section in the book about centrifuges. Um, or about using fractional distillation and rotary evaporators as a way to make your own essential oils or to d distill essences out of things. In fact, uh, one thing we do with a rotary evaporator, it sounds like maybe the stupidest cooking technique you could ever imagine. Um, we take the alcohol out of whiskey, which is like, What's the point of that? It turns out when you take the alcohol out, there's amazingly subtle flavors that you can't taste because of the strong uh, effect of the alcohol. Um, anyway, so that's what this is about. Uh, three is called animals and plants. Uh, that is about the basic building blocks of food, what is meat, what, is, uh, what are plants, and how do the properties of meat and plants affect how we cook them. Volume four, ingredients and preparations, is about modern ingredients, about thickeners. It's about gels and how gels form. Um, it's about foams uh, and emulsions. Um, <clears throat> we also cover wine and coffee uh, in this volume. And then finally, volume five is uh, plated dish recipes. That's where we, it's the only part of our whole book that looks like a cookbook. Um, and there we have a bunch of very detailed recipes. So watch closely, and I'll tell you what this is once it's done. So we bought this really cool camera that takes video at 6,200 frames a second. And once you've bought one of those, you just have to find a use for it. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me go back and do it one more time. And I'll explain it this time. So when water boils to steam, it expands in volume by a factor of 1,600. There's steam inside there. A fissure happened. It's a tiny steam rocket. You can't see the steam because steam's invisible. It's expanding to try to relieve the pressure. It can't quite, and it expands. And that is sort of uh, science and cooking in a nutshell. The physics of water, uh, popcorn uh, kernel, it, this, the way water is actually a very unusual fluid, 
Um, it's because of the hydrogen bonds in water that it likes to stick to itself that has such a high um, uh, boiling point, and why it has such a high latent heat of vaporization. And those things directly allow us to make popcorn. But now I'm going to move on to barbecue. And the first thing you have to deal with when you, if you want to talk about science of barbecue is what is barbecue? Because there's more than one kind. Uh, in the southeastern United States, southern barbecue is hot smoking with hardwood smoke. Oak and hickory are probably the two most popular, but there's, there's uh, other fruit woods and so forth. But it's got to be a hardwood, not a softwood, not pine, for example. Uh, it's always tough cuts of meat, brisket, ribs, shoulder. And you cook it uh, low temperature for a long period of time to tenderize it. Now, uh, I grew uh, I, was, I was about to say I grew up in Santa Monica, but I've been advised that that's probably not entirely truthful. I was young when I was in Santa Monica. Um, <coughs> and when we would barbecue in the backyard, we actually meant grilling. And grilling is a very different beast. That's about fast, high heat using tender cuts of meat. Um, the heat transfer is almost entirely by radiation. It's infrared um, uh, light, basically, that you're using to, to heat the food. And the flavor mostly comes from grease fires. Um, whereas the flavor up in the, the barbecue is mostly coming from, the, from unburned, vaporized wood. So they're actually two very different things, but we're going to talk about both of them and try to touch on each of these things. So, here is something on the structure of meat. This is a picture from modernist cuisine. And I won't go through all of it. It sort of starts at the scale of a steak over here, and it's a molecular scale by the time we get to this. The main point here is that meat is a set of uh, woven cables. And that's true at almost every level. At the smallest level, there are long chain molecules, poly polymer molecules of protein, uh, the most important of which is collagen. Uh, those are, are, uh, form fibers. Those fibers are almost always twisted and, and effectively woven uh, into networks, which then ha are woven into larger networks and larger networks and larger networks all the way up. And that's because meat has to be strong. Meat is a muscle. And the way it works is that those cables get longer or shorter. And, and that longer or shorter is how our muscles actually work. Now, there's a lot of difference between those uh, uh, collagen cables, if you were. <coughs> uh, old animals have different kinds of collagen than young animals. Different cuts on an animal uh, have quite different uh, characteristics. Uh, the toughest ordinary muscle on a cow uh, is generally the cheek. And that's because they chew their cud. Those cheeks are chewing like all the damn time. Um, the heart is smooth muscle. It's a different thing. Heart, the heart actually goes even more so. But that doesn't even have the same structure as these other skeletal muscles. So for skeletal muscles, it's probably the cheek. Uh, other muscles, tenderloins, are tender because they don't actually do very much. And you know, if you don't know, this is where your tenderloins are. They're right back over here. <clears throat> and those muscles don't get a chance. They don't have a very wide range with which they uh, uh, elongate. And they don't actually have to do all that much. So a large part of tenderness is about making collagen, um, uh, how to make collagen tender. T collagen is, is your key enemy in tenderness. There are other proteins besides collagen, but uh, sort of at a high level, it's probably is important enough to talk about it. And there's a couple of ways, four or five ways, that you deal with this in cooking. Um, the first is you allow a set of enzymes. The most important ones are called calpanes uh, it, to degrade collagen and other proteins. Meat will degrade itself. And the reason for that is that the process by which we grow, our bodies move and adapt, requires almost constant remodeling. You know, you're not the same person uh, you know, day to day, year to year. Your body is constantly tearing down and replacing tissues of all sorts. Uh, and if you age meat, this is why you're aging it. You're allowing a bunch of enzymes that are already in the meat to start uh, breaking those meat uh, proteins down. Um, now, if you hold it at a higher temperature, it goes faster. In fact, almost all chemical reactions go much faster as you increase the temperature, exponentially faster, until you reach a certain amount where you break them. And for most of the uh, natural proteins, you break them right at or a little bit above body temperature. 
so one te technique some chefs do is you can actually get an accelerated effect a little bit like aging uh, by holding uh, meat at about 100 degrees for a few hours. More than a few hours, and you're going to rot it because that's also ideal temperature for growing pathogens. But for a, for a sh short period of time, you can do that. Another way is to break it chemically, and that's to use uh, proteases. Those are enzymes that like to break collagen. And Amy's already mentioned that uh, a bunch of fruits, papaya, pineapple, fig, uh, kiwi, actually, um, all have these enzymes that will uh, break it. It's also why you will marinate things with either vinegar or, in some cases, an alkaline baking soda thing. You're trying to put the protein in a chemical environment it doesn't like to try to break and degrade it. And that will work. Um, now, it isn't all, each of these methods have their own issues, so they're, they're, n none of them are perfect. Uh, the way that you typically use in barbecue is this way. You convert collagen to gelatin with a long, slow cooking process in the presence of water. And that causes the collagen molecules to unfold and unravel, and to do so in a way that's permanent. They won't ravel back up into to collagen. Instead, they form gelatin. And that is the basis for most tenderization in cooking. And the trick there is avoiding juice loss. The final way is to mechanically break it. Of course, a knife works really well even on tough meat, and we'll see there's some ways that you can uh, harness that. So here's your big problem, though, in cooking collagen. When you make collagen hot, it shrinks. And the molecules kink up. And it kink, it's a little bit like if you have a really old telephone cord. Um, the people in the audience look old enough you know what a telephone cord is. Um, this is one of these things I won't be able to use that for that much longer. Um, but a really old telephone cord that's all kinked up, you, know, you have to pull it to, string, to, to stretch it out. And then if you let go, it like, oh, clump, wants to clump up. Well, a lot of proteins have that property. Um, and collagen. Uh, will start to shrink a little bit, but the shrinkage really happens once you get above about um, uh, 60 degrees C, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that causes the meat to wring itself out. It, all of the collagen is shrinking, and because it's in these cross-woven bundles surrounding everything, that shrinking is almost like you're wringing it, but it's from the inside out. And when you have a dry piece of meat, that's generally why it's dry. It couldn't possibly be dry in any conventional sense. Meat's typically about 75% water. Okay, if you, but that water is bound up inside there. And the free water, the juice that you get when you bite it, that you can get rid of. And that's generally how you get rid of it. And the key thing here is the higher you heat it, the more you're going to cause that to happen. There's an old myth that you should sear meat to seal in the juices. Um, it's completely false. You actually do the opposite. If you want to have juicy meat, you shouldn't cook it above about 140 degrees. Now, I should say, the temperatures I'm saying here are assuming that you have a mammal. So there's an interesting thing that, uh, of course, we're all meat at roughly 100 degrees. So guess what? You can't cook meat at 100 degrees, not a mammal meat. And almost all mammals have the same uh, body temperature within just a couple degrees. Birds run hotter. They have a higher metabolism uh, that's thought to be uh, for flying. So chickens have at least a 10 degree hotter um, uh, resting body temperature than cows. The reason that you generally have to cook chicken more, uh, at a higher temperature in general is because they were built to be at a higher temperature. And so you got like at least a 10 degree thing where, hey, you still aren't even up to the original body temperature of the bird. So of course you're not going to do any cooking. It's only when you get above that that you're going to start to cook. And remember, what cooking is, is we're chemically uh, distorting, breaking, irreversibly changing the proteins uh, with heat. Fish, on the other hand, fish are used to being cold. And cold water fish are particularly used to being cold. Uh, so I, don't, I, I cook uh, salmon. My, my personal preference is about 103 degrees. Okay. Now, next time you're in a hot tub, that's about 103 degrees. So in, in fact, we, we were going to do a picture for the book, um, Hot Tub Salmon. But <laughs> the cutting in half part got a little messy, particularly for the model we wanted to use. <laughs> so anyway, if you really want stuff to be juicy, you're going to have to cook it if it's a mammal below that. Um, so here's an example of what happens if you sear and you, you sort of ignore that. It looks beautiful. 
but you see all that wonderful looking juice? That ought to be in the steak. Uh, and if it's not in the steak, you're going to have a less good eating experience. And so the, the, the analogy here is that all of those fibers that are in that thing are very much like a rope. So one of the ways you can weaken a rope is to cut it. And it turns out there's a very clever device called a jacquard tenderizer. It's called a blade tenderizer. Uh, this one here has got 48 little blades. And you go chunk on this, and it sends those 48 little blades in. And you can see this is a very close-up picture. You can see the little holes. Now, that's because we pulled it apart a little bit to show the holes. If you go ka-chunk, ka-chunk, and you just look at the meat, it's almost impossible to tell. Um, it, a lot of supermarket steaks, they just routinely do this too, and no one even knows. And the way to tell is to look at the fat, because the fat doesn't heal up afterwards quite as well as the meat does. OK, so what that does is we've cut some of our ropes. Now, there's an interesting thing. Now, of course, that mechanically tenderizes it, because when you bite into the, this, a lot of those ropes are half broken. So it's much easier to break than raining ones. So either for the teeth. The amazing thing is, it's juicier. And I first discovered this like five years ago. And I was weighing, I was doing all these things, and I wanted to see how much juice did I lose. Because I poked all these holes in it, right? So of course you're going to lose juice. And consistently, all the things that I poked holes in weighed 10 to 15% more after cooking than ones I didn't. And the reason is, even though I was cooking this at, at relatively low temperature, by interrupting those fibers, the meat had less good hold on itself for, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, for wringing itself out. So more of the juice stayed in the meat where it was supposed to be. So a, a bizarre, a paradoxical, very counterintuitive thing, uh, and highly recommended. So, so we, we, we jacquard things all the time. Aging. So I mentioned aging allows this natural enzyme to do this, works much at a higher temperature. Now, it also causes um, the fat to oxidize a little bit. Now, oxidize is the polite word. In the kitchen, we would say, go rancid. It's slight rancidity that causes the, the set of rich, complex flavors in aged meat. Um, now, I'm OK with that. Um, well, some people get offended when I say it. Uh, the interesting thing about it is it costs time and it costs weight. So here's a, some pictures we did for uh, modernist cuisine. Uh, we took a, uh, a whole um, beef loin. And uh, age effect, we, we actually did time lapse, which is just amazingly cool, but I, I didn't uh, have the time lapse here. Uh, so this is the same piece of meat as it ages. After about 45 days, it looks like this one over here. If you trim the, the, the gnarly, bad looking part off, which is actually kind of good in its own way, but sort of as a raw jerky, um, you get this. Now, if you compare that to the original, you can see the muscles are in the same place, but you see how they've changed? And because the, the muscle has been affected differently than the fat, the whole thing looks different. Now, aged beef is expensive. And to see why, look at this picture. The white outline is the original piece of meat. Okay, That's how much we shrank the thing by drying it out. So fundamentally, what you're doing is you're uh, breaking down a bunch of these uh, uh, proteins to make it more tender. You're drying it out so it weighs 20, 25% less afterwards. Um, and you're causing a little bit of fat rancidity. So the other way, and the principal way used with barbecue, is long, slow cooking. Uh, southern barbecue is uh, famous for low and slow. Typically what that means is an air temperature of about 190 degrees to 250 degrees. And for a long time. And a long time is six, six and a half hours for ribs, 12 hours uh, for shoulder or brisket. And some people would double those numbers. Well, we did an extensive amount of experiments. We said, no bullshit. That's not low and slow. This is low and slow. Um, so we cook uh, our ribs for 48 hours, um, brisket for 72. Uh, our longest recipe in the book is oxtail. 100 hours was our preferred oxtail. So you don't come home and say, hey, honey, let's have oxtail. <laughs> no, it's, it's a 100-hour thing. Um, and what you get in return for that is because you're cooking at very low temperature, down where you're not shrinking the collagen very much, it stays incredibly juicy. Uh, 
It, you don't take all of the red parts of the meat and turn them gray. That's mainly because you take myoglobin, that's sort of the muscle form of hemoglobin that's in your blood that holds oxygen, uh, and you're chemically you're altering that with heat. Uh, you don't do that, so it stays a little bit rosier, and it's fantastic. Um, so we highly recommend a barbecue that is incredibly low and incredibly slow. Now, that said, you've got to do some, a few interesting things to it, otherwise it'll dry out. Um, and you, of course, I'm ex there will be a test later, so you can see if you memorize this. Um, this is just an example of one of the tables in modernist cuisine. Uh, there's, I don't know, 20 or so different meat, meats on there, pork ribs, lamb shoulder, pork belly, rabbit shoulder, veal breast, shank, trotters. Um, and for each of them, we give a bunch of different times and temperatures. We cooked a lot of meat to do this. Um, but this is, and the ones that are highlighted in orange, those are our favorite ones. But we also tell you if you want to do it other ways, because there's no single right way to cook. You know, uh, our preference for short ribs is to cook them at maybe 56 degrees uh, centigrade, maybe 135, 135 degrees Fahrenheit. But some people like a traditional braised sort of short rib. In that case, they better take it up to 175 and 180 degrees. That's not that one's right or one's wrong. They're totally different effects. And if you understand how the meat works, and you have a table like this, uh, you can get any result you want by choosing where you go. Uh, there's even a column, if you're in a hurry, you can achieve some of these things with a pressure cooker. But that's going to be at such a high temperature that it's going to be quite gray. But if that's the effect you want, then, uh, then fine. Uh, here's one of the examples. Here's a, uh, a uh, this is a beef cheek pastrami. We also make it out of uh, short rib. Uh, now this is not a quick recipe. Um, this one we brine it for five days, then we cook it for three days, then we smoke it for six hours. But it's really good afterwards. <laughs> uh, along the way, we uh, ran into a whole lot of different uh, parts of uh, mythology. And in barbecue, uh, among really hardcore barbecue fanatics, one of these uh, uh, topics of great mythology is called the stall. And what happens is you have a large piece of meat, and you put it in your smoker, or, or this is a real southern style barbecue, you put it in there, and it heats up, and it heats up, and the temperature is rising. Then it stops rising. It stalls. And it stalls for hours. And if you search for barbecue temperature stall on, on Google, you will find thousands of pages devoted to people arguing passionately about this. Um, and the great thing about passion arguments about food is that they are so rarely interrupted with facts. <laughs> um, tremendous passion, but very few facts. So we set out to say, OK, we, we, can't, we can't describe this and just say we don't know. So we wanted to figure out what the hell is going on. And there's tons of different theories. One theory that you see, very, sort of the most scientific sounding theory, is the reason the temperature stalls is you're putting lots of heat energy into breaking all of those collagen bonds. Now, that's a very clever theory. And it's clever because, of course, it takes heat energy to break the meat. Of course, we have something called a differential scanning calorimeter. So we put the meat in. And it turns out you do get a bump from breaking the collagen. It does take a little bit of heat, a minuscule amount of heat. There's no way it could last for hours. So eventually, we figured it out. Um, another thing is, oh, it's because you're forming the bark. There's all of this lore and legend about the bark which is some combination of the smoked meat and drippings from the fat and barbecue sauces and rubs and other things you put on top of it. That's the bark that's causing the stall. So it turns out it's because the meat dries out. Remember I said that it takes a lot of energy to boil water? Well, it turns out the meat's wet, 75% water. So when you put it in, its temperature is not the air temperature. Its temperature is something called the wet bulb temperature. That's the temperature that you would get if something was wet. Now, if you're at 100% humidity, wet bulb and dry bulb temperature are the same. That's why it feels very hot if it's 100 degrees out and 100% humidity, which in LA it doesn't really do, but, but you've heard of those other places. Um, <clears throat> the reason people say that dry heat, like when the Santa Ana winds kick up here and you get those hot, dry winds, the temperature it doesn't feel as bad because you're not at that temperature. You're at the wet bulb temperature because you're sweating. 
And you sweat enough, it carries that away. Well, it turns out the meat is effectively sweating, not through sweat glands, but it's evaporating. And so all of the energy that would go into raising the temperature is going into that. And that keeps happening until the surface of the meat dries out. Once it's dry, then it can start to rise again. Now, the thing that's really funny about this is the most popular recommendation in these barbecue forums, what do you do when you stall? Mop more sauce on. That makes it wetter. Okay? It's very much like trying to keep meat hot while you're running a garden hose on it. It wouldn't make much sense, but that's in fact what they do. It turns out foil, which is derisively known in the southeast as the Texas crutch, um, foil, it turns out, is a great idea for a portion of the thing because if you wrap the meat in foil, you trap the humidity. The humidity gets to be 100%. So to test this, we got a brisket. We cut it in half lengthwise so that we had both the, the fatty, the point part, and the decal. We had it all set up. One part we sealed. We sealed it in a sous vide bag. We could have wrapped it in foil if we wrapped it tightly, but we wanted to have it perfect. The other one we left uncovered, and then we stuck it full of thermocouples. We stuffed our oven full of thermocouples because we're like that. Um, so here's the dry bulb temperature, and we're staying, meaning, maintaining 192 degrees Fahrenheit here just constantly. That's the wet bulb temperature. The wet bulb, bulb temperature uh, initially goes up because the steam uh, moisture comes off the meat. So it's becoming more and more moist. But eventually, the rate at which the uh, air is being exhausted is faster than the rate at which water is coming out of the meat. So that means the humidity drops, which means the wet bulb temperature continually drops for the whole time. So here's what the covered brisket does. Initially, it comes up right up like the wet bulb temperature, just like it should. And then, notice as the wet bulb temperature is going down, it stalls. And in this case, it stalled for two hours. You know, if our smoker had been different and the, the humidity things had been different, you could stall it for an even longer period of time, potentially. Then it goes up. The reason it turned the corner and it went up is because the outside was now so dry that it couldn't, that there was still moisture inside, but the moisture was so far inside it effectively couldn't get out. You made a crust around the meat. In this case, we put no rub, nothing else. It was just a plain piece of meat because that was the cleanest test. So what about the brisket that we sealed in the sous vide bag? That's what it did. It had 100% humidity inside. It didn't see anything else. It, it came straight up. So, now, you may never have worried about the barbecue stall, but within barbecue circles, believe me, this is an important thing. Um, just actually this last week, though, um, there was uh, Anthony Bourdain tweeted that he was, um, he was someplace barbecuing, and he says, help, should I use foil? Ask hash modernist cuisine. And so I was in a business meeting, and they pulled me out, and they say, Tony Bourdain needs to know about foil. <laughs> And of course, my first response is, what, to wrap some little white powder? <laughs> Figure it out for yourself, Tony. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and then I thought, well, how am I going to explain this whole stall story in a tweet? <laughs> so we said, yes, use the foil for a couple of hours. Because what you want to do, in this case with the brisket, the problem is you want the brisket to be at a certain temperature for a period of time to get tender. But of course, if it's wrapped in foil or in a sous vide bag, you're never going to smoke the outside, so then you should take it out and put the smoke. Now, the even more efficient way is to cook it sous vide first, because then you don't have to worry about the smoker for all that time. And there's no point in having lots of smoke bellowing out of something that is wrapped tightly in foil. The smoke's not getting through the foil. <laughs> you're just using it as a heat source. But because you need to tenderize the brisket, that's a really important thing. A lot of people making a brisket at home uh, don't do this, and so either they don't get enough temperature on the thing for long enough, and it's tough, or they succeed and it's dry. And those are both sort of bad things. So foil for a period of time is a, a good thing. So now we'll talk about smoking. And there's a lot of ways people smoke. One way is, is by uh, indirect, uh, indirect heat in a uh, Weber or other barbecue. You put your coals over at one side, not very many of them. You put some uh, 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 hardwood chips on it and away you go. Um, this is the computer-controlled smoker in my kitchen. <coughs> it's a little nicer. 
it's got refrigeration coils, so you can do smoked salmon. Uh, but it's fundamentally the same thing. And in both cases, what you're doing is you're heating wood up. And there's a lot of mythology as to what's actually flavoring uh, the meat. But this has been figured out. What flavors the meat isn't the smoke, per se. It's a bunch of unburned gases. And in fact, you could, you could in fact do this without any visible smoke whatsoever. Uh, there's a Polish scientist who invented a whole technique for doing that. It, um, and then he wrote this big um, PhD thesis on it in Polish, deposited it at the University of Warsaw, and promptly died. Um, I found out about it, got someone to translate it. Um, he has this amazing system where you heat the wood in pure nitrogen so it can't combust, and then used that to flavor the meat. And without any combustion at all, you get this. Because really what you're doing is you're distilling a bunch of, you know, vaporizing a bunch of things out of meat. Just like a candle, the thing that you're burning is, of course, the wax, but not in solid form. It's the wax that is melted and then vaporized and drawn up the wick that is powering the candle. Well, the analogous thing with wood also occurs. It's those fumes that come out of the wood at temperature that, that cause this. So here's a brisket sort of before and after. Here's wood. Um, so the goals of smoking is to get those gases released by the wood, dry the surface. It turns out the humidity at which you do the smoking is very important. If the humidity is too low, it's too dry in your smoker, uh, it gets very dry on the outside. If you have ribs, you can take them all the way to almost being like jerky. Uh, and that's no fun. Uh, although one of the reasons that ribs are popular is because ribs are very fatty. And so ribs are relatively tolerant of being overcooked. Uh, and a lot of barbecue is just fundamentally overcooked ribs. They, they take it to the point of being tender, but they take it a little bit uh, uh, beyond that. If the humidity is too high, it's too wet in there, you can get a very sour, acrid taste to your smoke. So it turns out humidity control is, is super important. And the, the funny thing about smoking is that it was originally a preservation technique. The, the point of smoking was twofold. One is you wanted to dry things, but it, you can't dry them in the sun if there is no sun. Uh, so if you were the Native Americans uh, near Seattle where I live, good luck with those winter salmon. You just aren't, you're not going to see the sun for th four months. Uh, what are you going to do? So you build a fire with alder. Um, but because, it, the other thing is there are some preservatives. Besides the fact that it's heat to dry the stuff out, you also get some preservative effect. But because we like the taste of it, we now do it for reasons that are completely different. Of course, preservation doesn't make any difference. So now we'll talk quickly about grilling. Grilling is infrared radiation. Typically, the coals are about 1,800 degrees. Um, in a gas fire, it's usually a little bit lower, usually about 1,500 degrees. It's got to be tender meat because you're not going to cook it for very long. So you can't grill a brisket. You can finish a brisket on the grill if you cooked it some other way, but it would be way too tough if you just uh, grilled it. But because you're cooking it very quickly with very high heat, it's very easy to overcook it. And even if you cook it perfectly, you get big, thick, gray margins of overcooked meat. You can decide that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a true thing. Um, and the heat depends on the intensity from the coals, but not in a very obvious way, as I'll show you. So here's what I mean by those thick gray sides. So here's two pieces of beef. One we cook sous vide. Uh, and you can see there's almost no temperature gradient across it. It's all medium rare. The other one uh, we grilled. And you get a great crust, but you see those big, thick layers uh, of overcooked meat? Um, I, I'd prefer not to have that, because in this case, that's um, somewhere between 25 and 30% of the weight of the meat are in those layers. Now, I've talked to people who say, yeah, but that's part of the whole thing. I said, look, I got the, that millimeter thick layer. Yeah, I understand why you do that, because that imparts lots of flavor because of the browning Maillard reactions. Uh, but the gray stuff isn't doing any good. So uh, I said that the heat uh, doesn't depend on distance in an obvious way. This is the way it does depend. Um, so in this case, so I have a grill surface down here that's radiating. And uh, I wrote some computer programs to calculate all of this. Um, each one of these circular lines is a line of constant intensity. Now, if you're a cook, you'd like things to be relatively even. So if I say, what's the zone 
where the side to side evenness is within 10%, that's that horn shaped thing. If I want, and we call that the sweet spot, if I want to have the, um, uh, the, the meat be cooked evenly, I've got to be in that area. If I have it over here, it's not very even at all. So here's a picture that maybe puts that more in context. Here I've superposed it uh, on the, the barbecue. So there you can see a couple things. One is making small changes to the height of your grill makes no difference at all. So when people are out there and they've got a, a big grill and they're moving it up by like an inch or two, you may as well not bother. Unless you get a, quite a ways away, you're not going to make any difference at all. And in fact, for a long time, the farther away you make it, the smaller the sweet spot that's even. So after doing this calculation, I thought, well, God, there ought to be a way to make this stuff more even. So I thought about it, and we came up with a really trivial way. And here it is. It turns out Weber barbecues are just shaped wrong. Um, so we went to uh, Home Depot, and they have uh, duct for like heat, uh, hot air. So you buy a piece of duct, and you saw a piece of it out, and you put that down in there. And because it's shiny, it reflects the heat. Uh, if you've got a, um, a hibachi or something else, line it with foil. That black, nasty-looking hibachi, or, or the, those, um, when I was a kid, we used to sometimes go grill things. There's parks. There used to be parks in Santa Monica that would have these fixed grills set in the thing. Nastiest, black-looking stuff in there. Um, it turns out that's bad for heat transfer. You want to line it with foil. And the reason is interesting, and I made this picture to sort of show it. You know those mirrors in department stores where you put your head in and there's, it's a three-way mirror and you look and there's these two parallel surfaces and you see infinite copies of yourself? Well, effectively, if you put parallel mirrors on either side of the fire, the food sees infinite copies of the fire. So here I've drawn the rays, those red lines. So the reflected ray from that coal looks to the meat above like it was another copy of the foil over there, of the coals on the other side, like you'd mirror reflected the coals on the other side. So once you do this, the entire surface of the grill is now your sweet spot. So there's another tip. Line your grills with foil and ideally parallel shiny surfaces. It makes a huge difference. Here's another interesting thing about grilling, which is most raw food reflects about 90% of the infrared light that hits it. Um, that's particularly true of fish or chicken or light colored things. It's even true for meat, though. Which means at first it heats up very slowly. You're trying to heat it by shining light on it, but most of the light's bouncing off. Only 10% hits there. Now, as the food starts to absorb it, it gets hotter and hotter. Well, as it gets hotter, it starts to brown. When it's brown, it absorbs more. By the time it's very dark, it absorbs to 90%. This means that as you go, the rate at which it's absorbing climbs and climbs and climbs and climbs. And it, this is what a physicist would call a runaway process. So here is a real experiment we did with toast. Okay? The first um, two minutes, you've only barely colored the toast. By three minutes, it's okay. In the next 30 seconds, it's overdone. And then the next quarter of a minute, the next 15 seconds, it goes black. Why? Because down in this area, it's absorbing. The rate at which it's absorbing is vastly faster. Now, the problem for this as a, as a cook is that grilling is just wants to overcook. Because the closer you get to being done, the faster the rate goes up. So this is like, imagine you were parking. And instead of putting your foot on the brake, you were trying to park by putting your foot on the accelerator. Okay? That, that, that's a lot what this is like. The closer you are to the parking spot, the more your foot is at the floor. It's a problem. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about grilled flavor. The key flavor element in grilling is that fat drips onto the coals and flares up. That's why grilling is different than broiling. Broiling is where you have the radiant heat source up above, and there's a real flavor difference. Um, and there are people who think it's all about the charcoal. Oh, you need mesquite charcoal, this kind of. Charcoal doesn't matter at all, because it's charcoal. Okay. <laughs> When it was wood, yes, it mattered. But by the time you made it into charcoal, you took all the rest of that stuff out. Okay, what you're left with is the carbon. 
Um, so it really doesn't matter what the wood used to be. Um, some of them will burn a little hotter than others, but there's no flavor difference. Now, this is one of the reasons grilled vegetables don't taste like grilled meat. Vegetables don't have any fat to drip. So that's also why a lot of grilling recipes suggest that you marinate, quote unquote, marinate your zucchini in, oil, in olive oil. Well, you're not marinating it. It's not really soaking up. What you do is you're putting some oil on there so it'll drip it in the fire so it'll catch fire. So what we do is we have a squirt bottle. Turns out that works much better. And you, squirt, you just squirt the oil right in the fire, whoosh, you get the flare-ups. Um, here's our barbecue cutaway from the book. Uh, for a lot of the, cu uh, of the um, cutaway pictures in the book, we would put a piece of glass in front. And so when people see this picture, they say, well, how'd you get the glass there? Wouldn't the glass crack from the co uh, coals? I said, well, sure, there's no glass there. We just cut the thing in half. And this is, well, what, what keeps the coals there? I said, well, that was Johnny. You know, he was sitting below there with a pair of tongs, and every time one fell off, he'd, he'd stick it back up there. <laughs> it's really dangerous to barbecue with half a barbecue. <laughs> but you get a really nice picture. So it's these oil droplets and the fat flare-ups that come from them that really make the flavor. Uh, and that's why you have, so you have to add it. And yeah, here's sort of a close-up of that. Um, there you can see the, uh, uh, the way the meat is cooking. The interesting thing is if you left it in there long enough, if you didn't flip it, the top part will never cook. Uh, at least we ran it for hours. I mean, you can turn the, the bottom will carbonize and turn to charcoal itself. But the, there's so much water in the meat, and that water will, will turn to steam that you just you never can get the top cooked by cooking from one side. The only way you can do this is if you have something super thin, because if you have something really thin, then you can get enough heat to go through. And so now here is one of our, another one of those high-speed pictures. This is, uh, this is fat dripping onto a coal. And the interesting thing is it takes quite a few times before the flat flares up, because a lot of the energy initially goes into vaporizing it. Of course, there it goes. OK, with that, I conclude. OK, um, I think I, I, I'm Evan. I think I would like to start by um, thanking Nathan Mirvold for putting his considerable intellectual and financial resources to a subject that many of us are very excited about. So really, thank you. I find it sort of ironic that I'm sitting in a college where I would do anything possible to not run up against any kind of science whatsoever. And, and now I seem to be running towards it. And um, I, I'm wondering, John and Vinny, if you find yourself as this relationship that you've had with meat <laughs> for a long time, do you find yourself going down a road to where your knowledge needs to be sort of infected by more of this type of hard science? I definitely think so because uh, like when we hire people to cook when we're not there, like right now, <laughs> they got to know how to actually pull off the flavors that we're going for. So the science element is super important to create a recipe to be able to provide knowledge to these people so they can pull off the recipe when we're not there. I would, I would agree with that, and I would have to say that we actually had the opportunity to go to Nathan's lab up in Seattle and and get to experience what he was doing firsthand, and, and I was really taken by, you know, I had heard of, a lot about a lot of the techniques that he was using, and there's so many things that we would never even be able to use. He has so many tools and gadgets and cool things going on there, but a lot of the basic things that he was talking about, um, that some things that you can apply to the home and, and also in the professional kitchen. And his, uh, his book, his kitchen manual, actually is in our kitchen now. Um, and we use it. We haven't even started, you know, really haven't scratched the surface. But, uh, you know, a lot of the sous vide stuff that he has implemented, those charts and things have really helped us guide uh, to eliminate some of the human error that John's talking about. So do you think um, sous vide is sort of the, the first step on the road? I, 
it's it, the first step on the road to make sure that things are consistent. Yeah. And that's when you go to somebody's restaurant, you want it to have consistency. And sous vide something is, I mean, pretty much foolproof as long as they vacuum seal the bag correctly and set the temperature uh, correctly, which sometimes doesn't happen. Um, did you, are you involved at all in creating a pressure cooker that's made out of glass so we can see what goes on inside a pressure cooker? So making an entire pressure cooker out of glass is a little hard. Um, we actually worked for quite a while on, um, on making a one that had a, has a glass port in it. Um, it there's this, turns out there's all these formulas for calculating how thick the glass has to be. It's about three quarters of an inch. Um, and of course, it has to be heat stable glass. And then you have this interesting problem that as the pressure cooker gets hot, the metal expands. It turns out the glass expands at a different rate, so you got to calculate all this stuff. And we didn't get it done in time for modernist cuisine to actually have one that had a window where we could take a picture inside. Now, that said, is we actually know what happens inside. In a properly done pressure cooker, the water is perfectly still. It's not boiling. That's the whole point is that it's not boiling. Now, if you have your pressure cooker and you turn up too high, like you have one of those jiggling weight ones and the weight's about to fly off, or you have one of the spring valve ones and you've just jammed it and it's like up there, you know, like a, um, a whistling teapot, then yes, it's boiling. But, but that's actually not the way you're supposed to use it. You're supposed to use it just as it comes up to pressure. And at that point, it's in equilibrium. And it would look, if you looked inside, uh, like it was a slow uh, simmer. You'll have some convection that happens inside of it. Um, but but not, not much more than that. Uh, the pressure cookers are fantastic, by the way. Fantastic. It's one of our, like, in, when people ask us about all of the, the weird stuff we use, and we use some really weird stuff to cook, I got to say. Um, centrifuges and vacuum ovens and spray dryers. But the, one of the coolest things we, that we use is a pressure cooker. And it's just very underutilized or appreciated what, it's, what the thing is good for. So that's an example of something that uh, is all over the place. You know, t tons of people have them, or if they don't have them, their grandma had them. Uh, they're at every kitchen store, but they're underutilized. So I'm going to turn to some of the questions. This one's great because it's sort of political and uh, au courant. Nathan, you talked about debates concerning food being full of passion but short on facts. To that end, can you discuss your thoughts on the controversies surrounding the use of ammonia to kill pathogens in meat from a scientific perspective? Yeah, so this is the pink slime controversy. Um, okay, so we have a big section in the book on microbiology, or maybe the only cookbook in the world that has a uh, almost 100 page section on microbiology. Um, so we have a picture of an E. coli. It's much more attractive than you'd think. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we also have another whole section on food safety. And the, one of the biggest myths about food safety is that people think, oh, you have to cook this stuff because those pathogens are intrinsically in the food. And that's virtually never the case. There's a couple of weird cases where it's true. The primary cause of foodborne illness is eating shit. Okay? There's just no two ways about it. It's human shit or it's animal shit. If you could just stop eating shit, there wouldn't be this problem. Not served at animal. Well, here's the problem. The, the problem is animals shit. Sorry, but they do. Um, and even if when they don't, some, they can get cross-contaminated. So there was a, a case just a couple years ago of uh, spinach. Uh, grown in um, North Central California. Uh, and they finally traced this out. So here's what actually happened with the spinach. There was a set of cows, and cows can have E. coli. Uh, e. coli is in your gut already, by the way. But E. coli, um, uh, o H7 O157, I think, is the, the strain. That's actually very bad for us, but it's fine for cows. So there were some cows, uh, and they were in... It was sort of near Salinas is where this uh, all happened. And up against the mountains that they have there, there was this ranch that had the cows. But the ranch was five miles away from the spinach. So how did they found the E. coli strain in the cow pies. How did they get to the spinach? Well, it turns out 
In the early 1900s, a hunting club in San Francisco released some wild boar in those mountains. And there are still European wild boar, and there's actually a California hunting season on them. Well, these wild boar live in the area. The wild boar eat anything, including they eat cow pies, apparently. And they like spinach, because who doesn't want salad with their meal? <laughs> so the wild boar eats the cow manure. Then they break into the spinach thing, and then the wild boar eats the spinach and craps on the spinach. But then they wash the spinach. But because they want to lower their environmental impact and everything else, they have giant troughs in which they wash the spinach. So maybe one clod of wild boar poo this big went in, but it would have you know, probably a million E. coli per gram maybe a billion, something like that, so gigantic numbers. Once it goes in that big trough, all the spinach gets co coated with it. So it, you know, in terms of the ammonia thing, uh, ammonia does kill things. We use it in your kitchen. So am I in favor of ammonia for killing pathogens? In broadly, yes. Now, whether you should dip the meat that you eat in ammonia, which is what this process does, uh, that's a fascinating tr trade-off. I would prefer not to have that done to meat I eat by any stretch. But I understand why people do it. They, had, they do it because they had to do something to try to kill the stuff on the outside. And that's the thing. With, with any muscle meat, the contamination is on the outside. The only way it's the inside is if you poke it and put it in there. The inside of muscles is virtually always sterile. Um, so the, but the problem is, during the process of slaughter, during the process of, of all of the hands that touch it, from the farmer all the way to the plate, Somebody doesn't wash their hands, or there's some cross-contamination. I, I gave the wild boar example, but the same thing happens in the kitchen. Um, th there's this great powder. <laughs> I, I got to tell one more story, sorry. There's this great powder that's totally invisible, but it glows under UV light, and there's a liquid that's like that. And it's used sometimes in food safety demonstrations. So what you do, and we did this in our kitchen, is without telling anybody, you buy a dozen eggs, and you dust them with a the powder, and then you have them come in, and they come into the kitchen. And then, you know, a few hours later, you come in with, UV, with black lights, and the whole place will glow. Because no matter how much you think you're washing your hands, it, just tiny amounts of stuff um, go all over the place. A, a friend of mine used to be a Navy doctor, and he had a gross story like this, that during a medical exam, they did the same during a rectal exam for the, all of the sailors, they did the same thing, swabbed them with this same UV stuff, and then the next day went around the boat. And it turns out the whole boat was covered with fingerprints. <laughs> and the reason is we scratch ourselves, we don't always wash properly. The reason they have these norovirus outbreaks on a cruise ship is you're in a close, once you start getting a norovirus is a foodborne illness that causes diarrhea, once you start getting diarrhea from norovirus, you're very likely to spread it. I mean, unless you are scrubbing your hands like a surgeon with a brush and everything else, and so every surface in the boat gets that way, and so typically when a cruise ship gets it, half, half the, the folks do. Let's turn to something more appetizing. <laughs> that wasn't appetizing. Before I ask the next question, Vinny and John, do, while you have this opportunity, what, do you have anything you would, you would like to ask? Ask. <laughs> or not, share. No, I think not at this very moment. <laughs> Just thought I'd open yeah. it up. Um, lean cuts of meat, not fatty. How do you get them to taste good? Well, there's a lot of lean meat that tastes very good. Um, it's never going to taste very rich and fatty. Uh, so if, if by taste good you mean taste like something that had a high fat content, you're not going to do that. Uh, but most venison is very lean. Rabbit is incredibly lean. Um, and those can be delicious. So, the, the, but if it has a very low fat content, you shouldn't be cooking it very hard because if you start to dry it out, there's no fat to, to save you. Um, so in general, it's hard to give a recommendation for a broad thing, but I would say don't cook it past rare. Um, if we don't have a sous vide um, set up at home, and we want to keep that gray area of the meat as small as possible, below the, yeah. the Maillard. 
Um, is it better when you grill meat to keep flipping it over and over again rather than keep it on one side for quite a while and then flip it? Yes, it is better. And the reason is you're sort of averaging the temperature. It, you've, you've got a very hot surface. It's true whether it's a pan or a grill. You've got a very intense heat source. Now, if you flip it a lot, what the meat is seeing is, well, for 30 seconds it's seeing the really hot surface, and for 30 seconds it's, it's seeing the, uh, the air up above, much, much colder. Right? And so you're averaging down the temperature. So it's effectively a way to, to, as far as the interior of the meat is concerned, it's like you're cooking at a lower temperature if you flip it often. Now, you come from the, south, the, the Northwest. Yeah. Um, talk about planking, this idea of using wood, usually cedar, yeah. um, to, to cook, uh, that you soak, and then you cook fish, presumably, on it. Well, so there's a long... Uh, tradition in the Northwest of cooking um, uh, cooking meat on a, a cedar plank, uh, which would then be put exposed to a hot fire. And the cool way to do it is to have the uh, to broil it hard enough that you actually get the meat smoldering. Um, I'm actually not a fan of it with fish, but there's a chef um, Scott Carlberg in Seattle that has a brilliant dish, which we actually put in the book. And so he takes um, roofing. Um, uh, you, goes to, you can get cedar shake roof things. They work great. So you get one of those and you scrub it uh, and dry it out. Then he cuts a piece of uh, cheese, Parmesan or, or some other hard, really flavorful cheese. And he cuts it maybe an eighth of an inch thick, maybe a little bit thicker. Puts it on there. Then he puts that under a broiler um, enough so the cheese melts and the, the, the wood starts to smolder. And then he brings it to the table that way, on the plank with, with the, the, the wood smoldering. He drizzles a little bit of truffle honey over the top. And that's just an awesome dish. It's got two ingredients, or three if you count the plank. And <laughs> you're never going to get a lot of smoke penetration that way. So people who view planking as an alternative to smoke, to smoking. The, the cool thing about plank is that it's a presentation. In fact, what we do with the cheese, because um, we like cheating, a little bit is, yeah, we'll put it under the broiler, but we'll also hit the edge of the plank with a blowtorch. Um, because it's the presentation of the fragrant aroma of the cedar smelling. The cedar, if you actually smoke things in cedar, it's not a great wood to smoke things in. Um, it, 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 the flavor is just wrong. But a little bit of the smoldering thing at the edge looks really cool, and it fills the thing. So it's a great t uh, presentation technique. Did, when you were um, working on some of these recipes that required 100 hours of cooking, did you factor in the anticipation as part of the satisfaction at the end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's one dish we cook where, uh, I won't tell you the whole story, but at the end I say, you know, really what you're tasting, it isn't the flavor, it's relief. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the anticipation does have something to do with it. And uh, you know, a lot of, there's an old saying that there's no sauce quite like hunger. And it's true that the context of a meal, how hungry you are, what other things you've eaten before, has a huge impact on how you enjoy it. Um, and unfortunately, or for better or worse, those kinds of factors aren't easily captured with discussions of collagen shrinkage and temperature and time. You have to get a different kind of camera, too. <laughs> Um, a scanner, maybe. Um, John and Vinny, um, you talked about how you have found success in terms of um, consistency and like a tool for um, maintaining quality. Talk about some of the um, things that you've learned from, from Nathan that relate to flavor or, or technique. Well, I think that, you know, what he said before was that it's, it's based on personal preference, you know, and we all have, you know, our personal preferences and the way we like things and something that he might love and, you know, absolutely, you know, be fanatical about, we might not. Um, Give me an example, for example. You know, he, he might, he might, you know. Uh, today when he came, when we saw him today, he had lunch at Son of a Gun and he was like, the uni vibrata is unbelievable. Last night I got an email from the manager saying that somebody who I know was there told us how fucking disgusting it was and how <laughs> it needs to come off the menu ASAP when Nathan loved it. 
<laughs> yeah, taste is a very individual, totally. individual thing. Like I, ha I have to say that I find sometimes when, when I'm pre presented with a piece of sous vide meat that's completely medium rare all the way through, there's something about it. I don't know if it's an atavistic response, but there's something about it for me that is less satisfying. I feel actually very similar to you. I don't, we don't sous vide everything. everything no. We only sous vide certain things. Um, you know, it's personal preference. You know, what he might like, I might not like. And like where, you know, he said don't, don't use high heat at the beginning. Well, my favorite way to roast a chicken starts off at 500 degrees. So it, it is opinionated there. You know, your result might be different based on even what part of the United States you're in because the humidity level or you know the way the oven reads, or the you know of all ovens, the the standard for ovens now is 50 degrees from up or down from the temperature that's set is industry standard. So, for example, if you're at 350 degrees, it could be 300 or it could be 400, and it's still technically 350 <laughs> if you call a repairman. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why it's really good that most restaurant kitchens the it's at, the thermocouple's broken almost immediately because you <laughs> yeah. cook at such it's high heat. It's interesting that he talked about the barbecue and he had all the parts listed in the sous vide chart and stuff like that. And I know some some Southerners that are diehard whole barbecue, you know, whole hog barbecue, and they believe in barbecue is only done by wood, smoke, fire, and whole hogs. Like there is no such thing as using just. They found a knife. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, it, but basically, it comes down to their personal preference and, there's another and tradition. Thing he didn't talk about which is you know which goes into barbecuing. He briefly discussed it, which is brining, rubs, and then yeah. the most important thing, which is sauce. You know, like how many places have you gone to and tasted all different kinds of barbecue sauces? And when we were up at his lab. We yeah. tasted, I think, seven or eight, seven or eight yeah. different barbecue sauces from all different regions, which in the book he also discusses yeah. very deeply all the different sauces in different regions. And where I'm from, Florida, you know, it's different than North Carolina barbecue or in Tennessee or, you know, all, all the South, South has its own barbecue, quote unquote, that they claim <laughs> is their style. And that people will fight to the death Texas. about. Well, absolutely. In Texas, uh, particularly in central Texas, uh, near Austin, uh, some of the places are very hardcore that you should never use sauce. I was at one of these really famous places just a couple months ago uh, uh, with some people who were clearly not from Texas. Um, <laughs> we, we stuck out. And uh, uh, the, uh, after ordering the meat and so forth, the guy says, now do you have any? And the guy leaned forward, now you wouldn't be asking for sauce, would you? <laughs> no, no! <laughs> Not us. Even the bikes got mad. <laughs> so here's a barbecue question. Was the championship barbecue in Memphis 91 cooked sous vide at all? No. No, that was before I was doing sous vide cooking. And I was on somebody else's barbecue team, so I was like the low man on the totem pole. So I was on a team that won, but that doesn't mean it was me that won. Um, I, I was the, yeah, I was the stagiaire, basically. <laughs> I was the hog trusser. <laughs> now you thought there's a hog on ice under there. You go trust him good, will you? God damn, I'm out there hugging a dead pig. And <laughs> Can we talk a little bit more about stalling, actually? Sure. Because the stalling was very interesting. Because when we were in Texas, one of our favorite briskets that we had was actually wrapped in parchment paper the entire time when it was smoked to keep the moisture locked mm -hmm. in, or that was their philosophy. That's also a really good way of making sure your temperature never goes up too far. <laughs> yeah, it'll burn. You have a conflagration <laughs> there. Um, could you talk about the origins of sous vide? So we've traced the origins of sous vide quite extensively in the book. Um, there's a variety of precursors that uh, happened in the 1960s. Uh, one was a program that NASA did for the Apollo space program where they started vacuum sealing food in plastic bags. They started with cans, but the, the metal of the can was just weighed too much for them, so they went to a special plastic bag. Uh, there was a Swedish hospital system that appears to be the first set of folks that really set up sous vide. But my favorite thing about the history of sous vide is that the first restaurant in the world to ever serve sous vide to customers was the Holiday Inn in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> no joke. It was 
it, a year or two later, the Troigro brothers, at their three-star restaurant in um, uh, southwest France, uh, had hired a guy to help them reduce the, the loss on their foie gras terrine. And he, he started doing it. The guy was uh, George Prelou. And so he started developing sous vide. But it was a consultant that had worked on a hospital project in the Carolinas based on the Swedish system that then left and needed a job and went to the Holiday Inn. Um, and so in our book, we wanted to have a picture of the Holiday Inn. Well, because it's this sort of temple of the whole thing, right? <laughs> well, only they tore it down. So I needed one that was a 1970 picture of the Holiday Inn. So I went on the internet. And by God, there's some guy whose mission in life is recording the history of Greenville, South Carolina. And so I email this guy and I say, hey, you know, wouldn't happen to have a picture. You know, five minutes later, he sends me an email back. He says, I have a postcard from there from 1970. And so he sent me a scan, and we have that in the book. I'm trying to imagine what the Swedish hospital system food tasted like. Well, they had an interesting idea, which was also tried a bunch of other places. They had, I think, six or seven hospitals in Stockholm. And they wanted to have one central kitchen and cook there and sh ship everything out. Uh, and so they, they developed this sous vide system. Now, at the time, they were uh, boiling the crap out of it, basically. So it was, uh, I don't think it would have tasted very good. Uh, over a period of time, the parallel threads of this, a few people in the United States and a few people in France started experimenting with different times and temperatures. And because the Trois Gros brothers were you know, absolute top of the game, three-star chefs, and actually very innovative guys. So just one other brief story. Um, you know, until the Trois Gros brothers, all food in fine restaurants was plated at the table. It was considered improper to ever bring food on a plate. And they decided the hell with that. So they started plating in the kitchen. The, the first great dish they did, this was a salmon and sorrel sauce, which was a, a landmark in Nouvelle Cuisine. But if you think today how different the whole restaurant experience would be and how constrained we would be as chefs if you couldn't actually arrange things in the kitchen and plate and make it artistic, and it's crazy. But in fact, that was invented you know, during, I don't know, everyone's lifetime, but during my lifetime, that was probably in the late 60s. That whole thing was invented. You think, what an enormous change to the way we eat. So I mean, because of their involvement, it spread to a bunch of other places in France slowly. Speaking about sous vide again, the balance between low temperature sous vide cooking and avoiding pathogens. Well, so the first interesting thing is people always think that um, low temperature and for a long period of time must be dangerous, and they always have it backwards. Uh, what kills germs is both uh, temperature and time. So when we say we cook something for 100 hours at 130 degrees, people say, oh my god, how could that be safe? When in fact, it's the opposite. It was, you know, for the first 10 minutes, it might not have been safe. <laughs> for the first hour, it was getting pretty safe. By the time you're 100 hours, ooh, it's gone. <laughs> because the, over a period of time, the longer you do it, the more you're actually sterilizing it. So above a temperature of about 130 degrees, there really isn't a safety concern because by the time you're done cooking it, you're fine. Now, the one, one exception to that or one difference is fish. So I mentioned fish have low body temperatures. Uh, to my taste, most fish, I don't want the interior of the fish cooked above maybe 113 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And for some, even as low as 103, I was saying for salmon. Now, a good chef will often do that by searing the outside and leaving the inside just right. And on salmon, you can see. With other fish, you can't always uh, see that. Now, that temperature is not hot enough to kill anything. Um, usually, that's safe if you have good quality seafood, because usually there aren't any pathogens in there. All the contamination is on the outside. Um, now, the FDA has a rule for fish. that You have to bring it to 145 degrees for 15 seconds. It does absolutely nothing. It's a complete fraud. Um, that amount of time at that temperature won't kill hardly any pathogens at all. So it's a, just a complete bullshit regulation. 
So we found about six things like that in the USDA food code. So we, I went back to Washington, D.C., and I arranged a meeting with them. Now, it turns out they're not used to people doing this. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons they're not used to people doing this is, you know, if, if John and Vinny did that, they'd say, oh, okay, we know where we're going to inspect next. <laughs> <laughs> so as a result, I don't think, oops, sorry. As, as a result, I don't think John and Vinny have ever done that. Um, but hey, I don't have a restaurant, so. <laughs> Uh, and so I f we finally got a bunch of the scientists to admit, yes, that's right, it doesn't do anything. Uh, the standard for eggs doesn't do anything. The, the, the standard for eggs is also 145 degrees for, I think, for five seconds or something like that. I said, so what's it there for? And they said, well, that's the way most people like an over easy egg. I said, this isn't about taste. No one asked you that. Um, uh, you know, with respect to pork, they recently admitted that it was too high and they brought it down. They only brought it down about half what they should have brought it down to. Um, the actual technical standard is there's no difference for pork or beef or lamb. And people say, oh, well, what about trichinella or, or trichinosis, the, the, this parasite? Well, first of all, there hasn't been a case for commercial pork in the United States in maybe 20 years. Okay. The only time you get trichinella is from people eating uh, wild predator meat. So bear meat or mountain lion. Um, polar bear. Um, so those creatures get it, but, but, but pigs that aren't home, some home pigs, there was one, only one case from pork in recent history, and that was from a, a guy who's also a hunter who fed his own pigs the guts of the bear he killed. Okay, well, if you do that, that you're going to have a problem. Um, the, the CDC issues these wonderful um, findings after every major food outbreak. And there was one that occurred in Alaska when a bunch of native Alaskans found this um, beach twail. And at the end of the, and then they got they got very sick because they ate it raw. Um, and so at the end of this thing it says, finding, persons are advised not to consume beach twail carcasses. <laughs> okay, check. Let's you heard it here, folks. Don't you do that. Here's a question for John and Vinny. It's interesting. We were kind of talking about this before, earlier in the evening. How will you, not will you, but how will you find a way to keep serving foie gras? Well, we actually won't be serving it. It's going to be uh, too hefty of a fine for us to endure. Or somebody really, really rich wants to write us a very large, large check to keep just in case we get fined, we'll serve it. How large is it? It's uh, $1,000 a portion starting, uh, I believe, uh, June 30th. I said large. <laughs> no, that just means the portion has to be big, John. <laughs> Come on, family style, about. family yeah. style. You, you use transglutiamase and glue it into one really big foie gras. <laughs> it will be very interesting to actually see what happens with that you know, that whole movement, and hopefully we'll be able to turn that, you know, I personally feel the foie gras that we're serving at our restaurants is better than the chicken that we serve at KFC or our kids' elementary school, so. But part of the problem is that if you mistreat millions of chickens a year, you have the money for lobbyists, and so no one's ever going to say boo to you. But if you have a, what appears to be a small, effete group of foodies, oh sure, we can, we can penalize them and they'll just seem like a bunch of uh, elitist whiners. So it's very easy to beat up on foie gras, uh, whereas if you really said what's the, the largest number of animals suffering, it's surely not foie gras ducks, because they're just, A, there aren't enough of them. Um, the other thing is when you are producing artisanal products like the Sonoma, um, I haven't been to the Sonoma farms. I've been to the foie gras farms in upstate New York. Um, the conditions are fantastically better than any other place. And of course, all uh, meat-based stuff does end in slaughter and, and butchering. And that part isn't pretty. But we do all enjoy the result, or many of us enjoy the result afterwards. And doing it in as in ethical and as uh, a humane a way possible uh, I think is an important thing to do, but that doesn't, banning foie gras isn't the answer to that, I don't think. And also I think a lot of people don't realize the other impacts that are going to be had from 
banning foie gras with the the feathers and the duck fat and um the actual duck breast usually go to uh curing which a lot of restaurants serve you know cured yeah. duck prosciutto um confit you know if you go into a you know a market or a uh, that that has you know they serve you know prepackaged duck confit or duck fat. All those industries will be affected by yeah. this one well, ban. They're still going to go after getting that same product, but now they'll just take the liver and throw it in the trash, which is yeah. Um, I mean, your down pillow and your down jacket yeah. that came from from an animal, okay? And and it, it wasn't just sort of <laughs> they didn't just clip the outside of the feathers. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how that process works. Don't tell me that. I'm going to not be. <laughs> Given the fact that also it's just it's a natural physiological response for them to eat a lot before migrating. Yeah, yeah. their livers. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Their, their livers, when um, winter happens and they start their long voyage, are pretty engorged. Yeah. And then they go right back. And just I'll put it, this in your mind. Just think about what a duck looks like when he's eating a huge fish. What does his neck look like? Um, this is to Amy. Science and food truck? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. No, we'll, uh, yeah, we've definitely thought about that. And I guess there was a time when um, we were planning out the course. And at Harvard, we were very lucky to come across an untouched or relatively untouched lab space that was deemed food safe. So we could have the labs happen and students could eat right there in, when they were doing their experiments. And we were unable to find that sort of space on UCLA campus. And we've kind of come up with creative solutions for that. But at one time, I had this idea, because when I arrived, I was totally enamored with all the food trucks on campus and thought, this could be perfect. We could have a food truck where all the students could do their experiments. And on the side, we could serve food to <laughs> everyone in the community. And uh, at the same time, uh, yeah bring in some of the highlights of the science in the field as well. So what a great way to get kids interested in science. Drive that truck around. Somebody here, just make a donation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, how much more time? A few minutes. Oh, a few minutes. Oh gosh. I have a question for me. Are you gonna do a based on cocktails? Well, we've thought about it. Um, we've been lobbied to do lots of, of other books after this. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't cover was pastry, baking, and dessert. We have a couple of, of, of recipes and techniques in the book, but we really didn't cover it because you had to draw the line somewhere. Um, How desserts get off the Well, because it's a whole topic unto itself that would have brought, it, it would have been another three or four volumes. And, <laughs> That would have been another three and a half pounds of ink. Just so <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, and you know the, the, the basic business model for the, the, the book is similar to a story about the wine business. I, I found how to make a small fortune in the book business. You start with a large fortune and then you <laughs> write the book. Uh, so uh, you know, plus we wanted to have we wanted to get the book out there. You know, for we worked for five years on the book, and. Uh, through most of that time, uh, we didn't we had lots of people telling us that we were insane. Um, uh, some other people not telling us we were insane, but we knew they thought it. You know, they were just being polite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, look, before we go embark on another project of that scale, let's actually see if anybody likes this thing. Um, you know, we had a, a, I never took the book to publishers. I published it myself, um, at least in this country. But towards the end, we did take it to publishers just to see if maybe it would be simpler to have them publish it and distribute it. And one of them that was, was, was very interested, they said, so how many copies will you print? They said, oh, 3,000. I said, what? They said, oh, 3,000, it would be crazy to print any more. I said, well, okay, well, that, that makes it simple. I said, you know, you may be entirely right, and maybe everyone in my life is going to get this as a Christmas present every year for 10 years. But by God, I'm not, I didn't do all of this just for, for two or 3,000 copies. So we printed f um, 6,000. Um, <laughs> for the first printing, I wanted to print 10. Uh, but my guy said, you know, we ought to be a little more conservative. Said, OK, OK. And they sold out before they even got to the US. Um, and so we're on our third printing right now. 
Uh, we also, actually with John and uh, uh, Vinny's help, uh, we got a deal with Toshin to publish the uh, book in uh, French, German, and Spanish. And we've sold right now, depending, I haven't got the latest uh, things from Europe, between 45 and 50,000 books now have been sold the first year. Um, and, uh, and it's still selling very well right now, so we're hoping it's going to keep on plugging. We will do future books. The other thing, though, besides pastry, baking, dessert, there's lots of the topics. So cocktails is a great example. A ton of people working on modernist uh, cocktails, on new ways of rethinking it. You know, there's a popular cocktail called an Old Fashioned. But a lot of people say, well, that's, I mean, set aside whether you like that drink or not. It's an area that is ripe for creative people to say, let's make new fashioned. Let's make stuff that's absolutely new and different. And so there's a lot of interesting work there. That would be a possibility. We've also talked about doing things for the home. So we have something that's more focused for home chefs. Uh, we have uh, some representatives uh, in the, our book from many different cuisines. Um, uh, one of our cooks is Chinese uh, by ancestry. So we have a lot of Chinese food in the book. Uh, another one has some Korean background, so we have some Korean stuff in the book. We have another Indian, so we have some Indian food in the book. Plus, I like lots of stuff, so we have lots of other random stuff in the book. Um, and we thought, well, you know, another thing you could do is to pick some other, some non-Western tech uh, uh, um, cuisines and comprehensively cover them rather than little tidbits we had. Um, and I kind of also would like something where you don't, you could do a tiny little, you know, five, six hundred page book. Um, instead of the, you know, Five multi, well, that's little for us <laughs> compared to these multi-thousand page things that. I just have to ask one more question. The colors that we see in the book, yeah. like the strawberries or, or the jus around the steak, are those natural colors or have they been saturated by some false means? <laughs> well. There's no false means to make the strawberries look like that. Those strawberries, you know, that it sort of tells you what time of year we took the picture. Um, because you, you, you can get incredibly red strawberries. The other thing is there was a special technology to make all those colors look that good. That was the ink. So it turns out most printers' ink can't c cover, they can't show very saturated colors. Uh, and there's ways in Photoshop and other things to try to adjust that. And you adjust all the colors so the picture sort of looks the same. Um, it, but it's called a color gamut clipping. When you have an out, what's called out of gamut color, it's a color that was re occurs in real life, but the printing ink can't reproduce it. Oh, well, we thought that was kind of bullshit. So <laughs> we, uh, we got our printer to use a special set of inks called chromocentric inks. And those special, the chromocentric inks have a vastly wider color uh, range. And the place where that shows up the most is in highly saturated things. And we've got some uh, test pictures where you show the picture with conventional and not. So part of the reason is you've never seen a picture in a book like that because they didn't spend the money for the ink. So on that note, uh... <laughs> <laughs> thank you firstly to um... Evan for fantastic, articulate, moderating, and question asking. Um, John and Vinny for coming to join us to provide your chef's perspective and your own take on meat. And first and foremost to Nathan for coming to UCLA and giving quite a um, compelling lecture and discussion on barbecue. And to all of you for supporting science and food. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event or one of the future public lecture series. Thank you again. <laughs>